Hello, and welcome back to GI 101. My name is Dr. Dan Sadowski, and I am a gastroenterologist at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. In this podcast series, we have been discussing common clinical problems that arise from the gastrointestinal tract. With me in the GI 101 studios today is my co-host, Dr. Adriana Lazarescu. Adriana, what are we going to discuss today? Hi, Dan. Today I would like to present a patient who was referred to me for assessment of fecal incontinence. Okay, that sounds interesting. She was a 55-year-old woman who has been having accidents with leakage of stool into her underwear for the past three years. As you can imagine, this is very embarrassing to her and she has stopped leaving the house as she is worried about having an accident. That sounds very distressing. Why do you think she waited so long to ask for help for this problem? Many people are embarrassed to talk about their bowels, especially problems like this. I'm glad that she did eventually seek medical attention for her incontinence, since there are ways in which we can help her. Before we go any further, perhaps we should actually discuss the mechanisms of fecal continence in the first place. That's a great idea. Defecation is a complex process. As stool travels through the colon, it eventually reaches the rectum where it slowly accumulates. The rectum has a degree of compliance, meaning that initially the volume increases with no associated increase in pressure. Eventually though, as more stool accumulates in the rectum, the pressure does begin to rise. And this triggers two things to happen. First, the person gets the urge to defecate. Second, there is reflex relaxation of the internal anal sphincter muscle. When the person decides to go ahead and have a bowel movement, he or she will sit or squat, which straightens the anorectal angle caused by the puborectalis muscle. Straining then causes increase in intra-abdominal pressure. This increase in pressure leads to descent of the pelvic floor and contraction of the rectum. With voluntary relaxation of the external anal sphincter muscle, stool can then pass out through the anal canal. Overall, fecal continence depends on the rectum, anal sphincter muscles, puborectalis muscle, the pelvic floor, the consistency of the stool, and the mental function of the person. Wow, that sounds complicated. I don't usually give it much thought. Well, when it works well, you don't have to think about it. It's when there is a problem that we have to carefully figure out which piece or pieces of this puzzle aren't working. Adriana, you mentioned that there are two anal sphincter muscles. What's the difference between them? The internal anal sphincter muscle is made of smooth muscle. It is tonically contracted, keeping the rectum closed. This is an involuntary muscle, meaning that you cannot contract or relax it at will. It will relax as a result of the rectoanal inhibitory reflex, also known as RARE, which is triggered by stretching and increased pressure in the rectum. The external anal sphincter is made of striated muscle. You do have voluntary control over this muscle. It's the one that you can squeeze so you can delay a bowel movement so you can get to the bathroom. So getting back to our patient, how are you going to figure out what part of this complex mechanism isn't working? First, we need more information. It is important to know whether she is incontinent of a large volume of stool or whether there is a small amount of leakage of stool colored liquid into her underwear. I also want to know whether she has the urge to have a bowel movement and cannot reach the bathroom in time or whether the accidents happen out of the blue with no warning. The consistency of her stool is very important. We all know that it's harder to hold on to reach the bathroom when we have diarrhea. She told me that she gets fairly small volumes of stool in her underwear, but has no warning when it is about to happen. Her bowel movements are regular, occurring most days, but they are soft to loose since she had a cholecystectomy five years ago. So is there anything else relevant in her history? She has had three children. The first two were delivered vaginally and she had a tear with the second one. She cannot remember how bad it was. Her third child was delivered by C-section. She denied any urinary incontinence or neurological symptoms. She had no rectal bleeding or pain. So 
What do you look for now on physical exam? It is important to do a perianal examination first. Are there any scars from her obstetric tear? Does the anus look closed? Are there any skin tags or external hemorrhoids? Are there any skin abnormalities, fistulas, or fissures? The digital rectal examination comes next. It can give you a sense of the anal tone both at rest, which reflects the internal sphincter, and when you ask the patient to squeeze the finger, which reflects the external sphincter. My patient had a faint obstetric scar, but no other abnormalities on visual examination. Her anal resting tone and squeeze pressure were a bit weak. Now, you keep focusing on her obstetric history. Why is that? Obstetric tears and episiotomies can injure the anal sphincter muscles. But this woman is 50 years old. Why is she now having fecal incontinence and not right after her deliveries? Well, remember that continence is a complex mechanism, and if part of it isn't working, another part may compensate. Certainly, if she had a fourth degree obstetric tear, then she would have likely been symptomatic at that time. Does she need any tests to investigate her fecal incontinence? Yes, she does, Dan. I usually do a CBC and screen for thyroid disease and celiac disease. Patients with severe diabetes and other diseases can present with fecal incontinence, though it is usually not the initial presentation of that disease. If patients have significant past medical history of diabetes, scleroderma, or neurological conditions, I look into it further, but not otherwise. I usually do a flexible sigmoidoscopy to rule out rectal pathology such as proctitis or a mass. In a patient over the age of 50, I will offer a colonoscopy instead of a sigmoidoscopy, as it can act as colon cancer screening as well. If the patient has significant diarrhea, the stool should be sent for microbiology and biopsies should be taken for microscopic colitis. Is there anything else you would do? For many patients, this is sufficient and we can focus on management of the fecal incontinence. If the problem is more difficult, an anorectal manometry study can be helpful in measuring the strength of the internal and external anal sphincter muscles, as well as assessing rectal sensation. An endoanal ultrasound can look for breaks in the anal sphincter muscles if the pressures are weak. Okay, thanks for that review, Adriana, of the presentation and diagnosis of fecal incontinence. Perhaps next week we should go on and talk about management. Sounds great. Okay, see you next week. Bye.